So yes, thank you. Uh, test, test. Thank you all again for, uh, for making it down here. I do apologise for my tardiness, but due to the best efforts of our national carrier, I was still able to make it here on time. I'm going to say it is good to be home. I grew up in this city. I left it about 10 years back, but I do enjoy coming back down. And despite the weather, which is also seeming to conspire against us tonight, I do uh, appreciate all of you coming out. And I do appreciate also that uh, we're probably keeping you from dinner and, uh, and possibly other plans. So thank you for sticking around. Um, we're going to, I'm going to do a, a bit of an interview here now with Peter and then we'll open it up to the floor. So if you've got any questions, please keep a note of them and I'll, uh, I'll endeavour to get to a few of those before we, um, we end with the formalities tonight. But uh, it's an exciting time. I think any of you, you know, the fact that so many of you are here is testament to the amount of activity that's simply happening around what we might call the digital, interactive or new media space. Um, and I guess I was a little bit worried in some ways that I always figured it must be getting close to the end of the boom when the accountants are becoming the superstars at the parties again. Um, but you yourself have been around uh, a lot longer than this particular boom. I think you started off in this industry in about 1994. And what I wanted to find out was, you know, based on the work that you're doing, the heritage that you have, and the fact that Facebook was just valued in the, the billion dollar range, do you think we are heading towards another bubble phenomenon? Do you think there's something a little bit um, longer lasting with what we're seeing at the moment? Well, um, yeah, so I, I'll admit it, I am an accountant, I'm a chartered accountant, and I used to be a, a liquidator and receiver. Um, so I was a toe cutter, and um, yeah, if you're in, your business is in trouble, come and see me. But um, yeah, so having sort of cut off a lot of toes over the years, um, I, I got into the web back in 94, and it seemed a lot more exciting and sort of working with people with talent and money as opposed to people who ran companies that went broke. So, <clears throat> But if I look at the... Um, the dot-com boom, the, and I, I did a lot of work with VCs and you know, high net worths looking at the values of stuff. And it, as, a, as an accountant, what you fundamentally look at is, is there profit, is there growth, <coughs> is there a market, is it growing? Um, so the fundamentals, but the valuations just went berserk based on a, a sort of hype. And, and, but we've seen the same thing in railways, we've seen the same thing, aeroplanes, and any sort of emergent technology tends to go through a, a rapid cycle of hype, um, then you have a crash, and then you move on, you, get, you sort of stay in the pit, sort of pit of despair for a few years and it starts to move on back into, I suppose, what you call a real economy. Um, if you look back in uh, 99, there was a lot, of, uh, <coughs> a lot of the VC money was being spent sort of trying to grab, uh, I suppose, grab mind share through big money and advertising and stuff, but these days if you look at the sort of growth of, say, internet advertising, spend of companies on web, the, the values stack up. So take the MySpace deal, um, so Murdoch bought it for 580 million, and then he turned around about three months later, and he, <coughs> what he did, he just sold that search bar to Google for three years for 900 mil. So why would Google pay that much? It's because if you've got you know more than 200 people using MySpace and the the search there is their core search place, and you can serve the ads to them, and there's advertisers who want to pay for it, you know the, the numbers just stack up. So whether I think I think the valuation on Facebook um, that what's his name Zuckerberg reckons it's worth about nine bill. Um, maybe that's a little bit toppy, but uh, but but the the reality is is if you look at the growth of that thing, but also the the way that they've built that platform so other people can build the applications for them. So you think of their cost base. So there's since May there's been what four and a half thousand apps. I think last time I looked, which was probably yesterday, and we've built a couple of them ourselves. You got people like us building their apps for them, but we can make money, f money from doing that through advertising if we can get um, traction. So this sort of notion of a platform that others can build and, and make a, an income on is, uh, drives that valuation. So it's worth more than a billion, no question. Um, but you know, if it's worth nine, who knows? But clearly, I, they don't publish their accounts because they're a private company, but they would be raking in the cash. And that does seem <coughs> to be one of the differences these times around in the... Uh the VCs are almost having difficulty getting a toehold in some of these companies. I know talking to the guys at Atlassian, you know, there are 116 yeah. people now without a cent of VC in there so far. Is that something you're finding? Are you actually finding the, the VCs are starting to come to you guys to find out how they can get a slice of the action? Yeah, yeah well, I, f I fundamentally think, and there are probably some VCs here, I fundamentally think their model um, is wrong. Um, I look at the deals that they do, the amount of money that they spend in doing due diligence and all that sort of stuff. We launched a startup last week called LiveBidder, which is a mobile app that um, suck, just hangs off eBay and just alerts you to a watch list, but you can also bid straight from it through a little app. It cost us 10 grand to launch. Now, our sense is we can launch 
it's quicker for us to launch things these days than do a business plan. And again, I'm, I'm not a big fan of business plans. I think you only need a business plan if you're trying to raise money or sell your business. Um, you should think of it if you're a startup in terms of project plans and milestones and value drivers. So, um, so th there was an article in Business 2.0 a couple of months ago about these guys who were sort of knocking out you know, startups for less than 100 grand. So we take the view that if it's quicker for us to, to launch a, a prototype and test if the model works, and we can do that real quick, um, we, we don't need VC money or stuff. It's like you know, a couple of guys in the bedroom on the weekend, and it's become a lot easier to do this stuff. So you know, you, the, the technologies and stuff we used back in the early 90s were clunky, um, but these days you can you know, just jump on other platforms and off you go. So, so my sense is that whilst there's still some, you know, in the sort of deeper technology or chips or other things, sometimes they need a lot of money. Oftentimes these days you can get started, you can get customers quickly, and um, off you go. But I think the Atlassian boys are fantastic. You know, they've done a great job. This is one of the things I'm noticing now that obviously there are companies that are looking for capital right at the moment, but it doesn't seem to be capital that's constraining the market. It seems to be more a question of talent and being able to find the people you need in actually order to, to continue to, to take advantage of the growth that you're seeing out there. Would you agree with that? I mean, is, is that what you think might be potentially holding back some of the, the explosive growth we could be seeing? Um, I, I, I think generally, and this sort of comes from both the, the web world and the world I used to live in, um, it's people who don't know how to run businesses generally is what um, constrains them getting access to capital, um, particularly if it's other people's money. Um, but th there is clearly a shortage of talent. We're, we, we, we sort of are struggling if, in terms of um, top class developers. We're not really struggling there, but we run a grad program. Um, so we pull in elite guys um, early in their careers and give them a career path. Uh, but not many of the sort of web companies or smaller companies, d you know, have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, the other, but where we're really struggling is really high, you know, world class creative designers. So. Um, you know, when we adv advertise for that, we might get 100 um, applicants, but, you know, three or four might, would be, you know, sort of cut the mustard. So I think w what, uh, what, where I see Australia potentially constrained is in, in the creative side, because again, I think the, the world's moved from the back end, the back end's got easy, and you get your return on investment on the front end. So, and that's what we're saying to our clients. It's like, if you look at the investment you're making in technology, you're spending shitloads on hardware, stacks of money on applications, but at the end of the day, if you say I can, you know, save five bucks by people doing something online as opposed to doing it, you know, face to face or in a call centre, but if they go online and they can't use it or it's too hard, um, from a usability point of view, you know, zero times five bucks is zero. So my sense is that the the buyers in the Australian market of say technology services or web services are still still tend to be sort of CIO, back office, um, you know, back end system guys, and the um, I think where there's going to be a shortage going forward is in the sort of high class creative guys.